not only is the moral law binding on believers as well as unbelievers, but the authority of God Almighty is also binding upon all people, even those who hate God. Those who claim the law is no more than an evolved social construct, chart, changeable at the whim or evolution of human beings, are not merely making a mistake. They're not merely in error. They are falsely and sinfully denying the sovereign authority and word of God. In the end, all will face these truths at God's judgment seat. In the meantime, benefits and consequences of obeying and violating God's law are experienced in life by all. Thankfully, Christ saves his elect from the just condemnation and wrath of God for our law breaking. But the law itself is not thereby nullified or set aside. Again, as our confession states, Christ in the gospel does not in any way dissolve, but much strengthens the obligation of all to obey God's law. We acknowledge and confess this every Lord's Day, don't we? We hear the law proclaimed from God's word, and we confess that we have broken it, fallen far short of, of his requirements, and committed many sins. We know and confess that his judgment of our sins is righteous and just. Yet we also confess that in Christ we're forgiven of our sins as he intercedes with the Father on our behalf. When the Father sees us, he sees his Son as the obedience and righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. So if we said the law and our duty to obey it was abolished or diminished, we would in fact be denying the very gospel of Christ, wouldn't we? We'd be denying the continuing efficacy of his perfect obedience on our behalf. In other words, if the law is removed, we have no need for confession, repentance, and forgiveness. As it is, the perfection of Christ's obedience, in contrast with our own disobedience, reminds us of our obligation to obey the law in honor and gratitude to the one who kept it perfectly on our behalf. We practice obedience to the law for his glory and for his honor, for our own good, and because he says so. Now before moving to paragraph 6, let us consider briefly uh, in advance something we will draw from that paragraph, namely three important uses of God's law. So think of this as a sneak preview here. These three uses and applications of the law, which can vary somewhat in the order presented by various writers and speakers, are revealed and confessed in paragraph six. Because this paragraph is somewhat long and densely packed, it will help us to walk through it piece by piece. Uh, accordingly, we'll separate that paragraph into several parts, five precisely, designated for our own purposes today as A through E in your outline. There's nothing official about those parts. We just did that to make it easier to walk through and understand. The first part of paragraph six will be part A. That and the last part, part E, you can think of as forming bookends or a frame around the middle parts, B, C, and D. That's a good way to look at the structure of it. Sections B, C, and D present, among other related things, three uses of the law, B, C, and D. These three uses or applications of God's law may be described as follows, and we'll expand on these descriptions as we go along. First, section B, when we get to it, will allude to the civil use of the law civil use of the law. That is the way in which God's law serves as a curb and rule of life that restrains and reduces man's law breaking. And the uh, 
the key word or the trigger word there that many use, I use, is, is curb. So the first use will be a curb. The second, section C, will describe a revealing, drawing, teaching application of the law, often referred to as a mirror, reflecting back to us our sin and depravity alongside the holiness of God and compelling us to recognize our deep need for Christ and the gospel. Thirdly, section D will present the normative or instructive use of the law, often referred to as guide, instructing believers along the path of obedience and sanctification until Christ returns. It helps many, again, to think of these three uses and applications of the law as curb, mirror, and guide. This short-form terminology can make it just that much easier to recall the three. I, for a long time, I've used a mental picture or a mental allegory, and, and if, if you like it, you can use it, and you can expand it when you're meditating uh, on the Word of God and on these uses of His law. Uh, but the short form of it is, I picture uh, walking up to a curb and stepping up on that curb up onto a boardwalk. And that curb is the first word for the first use of the law. It reminds me that the law is a curb, a, a restraint against sin. And as I step up on that boardwalk, I see a mirror facing me. And that's, that's the second use, the mirror. And that's where I see my sin, my depravity, and the holiness of God. And then as I turn to walk down the length of the boardwalk, I see a sign with an arrow, and that's a guide telling me which way to go. So I have a curb, a mirror, and a guide. Um, so we turn now to the first portion of paragraph 6, designated, uh, I believe it's 6.A. Yeah, 6.A in your outline, immediately after which the three uses will come into play. Again, reading from Chad Van Dixhorn's modern text version, paragraph 6a, although true believers are not under the law as a covenant of works by which they are justified or condemned, nevertheless, the law, that is the moral law, is of great use to them, that is to true believers, as well as to others. So the important opening frame or bookend of paragraph 6 here stresses the fact that those in Christ are not under the moral law. This does not at all mean that we're not obligated to obey God's law. It means we're no longer under the law as the means of earning God's acceptance. That is, we're not saved by works of the law. Instead, for those in Christ, the law has been fulfilled by Christ and is written in our hearts as he enables and accepts a new kind of obedience, a new kind of obedience that comes from love and delight in him. We confess here that the law is of great use to us and to unbelievers, and our confession goes on to explain how this is so. So now we go to paragraph 6b, or section 6b of paragraph 6. Reading, by informing them, believers and unbelievers, as a rule of life, both the will of God and of their duty, it, the law, directs and binds them to walk accordingly. This speaks of the law as a rule of life, which serves as the curb, there's the curb, against law-breaking and a general restraint of evil. So there again is the first of our three words. Applying to all people, this first use and application of the law is in large part an expression of God's common grace, blessing and preserving mankind in general from total depravity and self-destruction until God's redemptive plans are completed. 
This curb, or restraint of evil, also serves to help protect the justified from the unjust as God preserves and sanctifies his elect, both the converted and, and yet to be converted. Uh, the Westminster Larger Catechism, answer 95, states, the moral law of God is of use to all men to inform them of the holy nature and will of God and of their duty, binding them to walk accordingly. The moral law as a curb keeps human society more civil than we otherwise would be without God's law. Therefore, this is often called the civil use of the law. In fact, God's moral law is built very much into our civil law, isn't it? As, as Rob Olson noted last week, uh, the law is also wired into our consciences. And in these ways, his law informs us as it discourages and restrains our law-breaking. One writer put it this way, this aspect of the law promotes civil order and protects citizens from those who would cause harm, and it equally applies to both believers and unbelievers. Of course, the curb or civil use of the law is far from perf perfectly observed by fallen human beings, including those who are in Christ. In fact, as it's stated in 1 John 1.8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Still, God's law as it curbs and restrains evil provides a measure of justice on the earth until the final judgment and until those in Christ are completed in him. The next section of paragraph 6, uh, this is designated uh, C in your outline, highlights a second use and application of God's law. Reading, it, God's law, also reveals to them the sinful pollutions of their nature, hearts, and lives. Therefore, when they examine themselves in the light of the law, they may come to further conviction of humiliation for and hatred of their sin together with a clearer view of their need of Christ and the perfection of his obedience. This portion of our confession alludes to the use of the law as a mirror, by which those being called to faith in Christ see our sin with conviction, humiliation, and hatred of it, as the Spirit reveals the law and our breaking of it and our need for Christ and his righteousness. As such, this second use of the law as a mirror serves as an extension of God's special grace to his elect. In other words, the law is used by the Spirit of God along with the gospel to call, to effectually call the elect to faith and repentance as we are enabled to see our desperate need for uh, our Savior and for the gospel of Christ. This second use of the law is sometimes called pedagogical. Pedagogical. A word we never use, but unless it, you're reading an article about the second use of the law, it's pedagogical, which refers to teaching and leading us like a schoolmaster to Christ. Serving as a mirror, the law also shows the unsaved their sin and can bring conviction which can help restrain sin and evil even when they're not brought to faith in Christ. Thus, this second use of the law also serves as an expression of God's common grace. John Calvin wrote this, quote, The law is like a mirror. In it we contemplate our weakness and iniquity, and finally the curse coming from both, just as a mirror shows us spots on our face, unquote. Calvin alludes to Romans 3.20. By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. The Apostle Paul emphasizes this point also in Romans 7.7. 7. If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet 
if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Uh, we all know that there are countless counterfeit mirrors in our society and in our culture. Any number of mirrors. One writer captured this idea poetically, describing the unbeliever who, and I quote, worships at an altar of a stagnant pool, and when he sees his own reflection, he's fulfilled. Unquote. That one gives me the chills. Um, false mirrors can even be found in some so-called churches. One well-known so-called preacher encourages people to gaze into an actual mirror and declare their own greatness. He claims that such an action can cause their greatness to become reality. If I say it, it's true. And if I look in a mirror and say it, it makes it true about me. So that's another false mirror. And we can think of many more. By contrast, those predestined to faith and repentance look into the, the mirror of the law and see our complete need for Christ and the gospel. Not because we are intellectually, morally, or otherwise superior to anyone else, but rather because God chooses to raise us to life in Christ by his grace alone and by the power of his spirit. So, so far we have seen two uses of the law as a curb and as a mirror. The subsection of paragraph 6 marked D on your outline is next. Describes a third use of the law. This is a little bit longer, reading section 6D. The law is also useful to the regenerate because by forbidding sin it restrains their corruptions. By its threats, it shows them what their sins deserve, and although they are free from the curse threatened in the law, it shows the afflictions that they may expect because of them in this life. The promises of the law likewise show to the regenerate God's approval of obedience and the blessings that, may, that they may expect as they obey the law. Although these blessings are not due to them by the law as a covenant of works. So if they're not due by the law as a covenant of works, then they come by grace, don't they? Again, we've already seen that the law of God is useful in application as a curb and a general restraint of evil and as a mirror revealing our sin and need for Christ. This third function of the law is often called a guide for believers. Those who are in Christ are guided by the law and by the Spirit who works in us a desire and ability to obey Christ and pursue righteousness in this life. Thus the law serves as a guide and a means whereby those who are in Christ grow in obedience as we're sanctified by grace through the Word and Spirit. The third use of the law as a guide is often called the normative use or instructive use, referring to the fact that the law serves to prescribe norms and patterns for the life in Christ. As we read in Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. A major implication of this third use of the law, the normative use or guide, is that we are not to lay the law aside because of God's grace, but we are to seek and desire to uphold the law in obedience and gratitude. As Paul wrote in Romans 3.31, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So here, within a single paragraph 6 of chapter 19, we encounter three uses of the law. This brings us to the fifth and final section of paragraph 6, marked small letter E in your outline. Therefore, the fact that a man 
does good rather than evil, because the law encourages good and discourages evil, is no evidence that the man is under the law rather than under grace. And this is repeated all over the place in this chapter 19 and elsewhere in the confession, isn't it? It, it, and this closing bookend of paragraph 6 is in part a restatement of the opening sentence, which is section A in the outline. Both bookends, section A and section E, stress that we are not justified according to our obedience of the law, but according to grace in Jesus Christ. Our practice of obedience to God's law is no evidence that we are justified by keeping the law, because we're not. The critical distinction between law and gospel is emphasized repeatedly in our confession, namely that God's grace cannot be replaced and it cannot be supplemented by any merit of ours. Therefore, we must never lapse into the error of basing our justification on our sanctification. As we will see confessed in paragraph 7, while the law and gospel are distinct, and that distinction is very important for us to know and keep in mind, the, the law and gospel are clo also closely related as expressions of God's grace. The law of God is in fact founded in grace. As we've seen, it is given by God as an expression of his common grace and his special grace both of which emanate from his very character and being. Ligon Duncan has written this, quote, The law shows you what righteousness looks like in a specific circumstance. It shows you what love looks like in a specific circumstance. That's what the law is. It is a reflection of the character of God and an authoritative expression of what it means to love and to be righteous, unquote. So in paragraph 6 of chapter 19, we have encountered and confessed three uses or applications of God's law. All three, curb, mirror, and guide, apply to our eternal benefit as the law preserves, reveals, and guides us in Christ and in sanctification. And finally, we, we come to paragraph 7 of chapter 19, where we see that while the law and gospel are distinct, they're not separate. Reading chapter 19, paragraph 7. These uses of the law, these uses of the law do not conflict with the grace of the gospel, but are in complete harmony with it. For it is the Spirit of Christ who subdues and enables the will of man to do freely and cheerfully those things which the will of God, revealed in the law, requires. We confess here that it is by the grace and Spirit of God that we are willing and able to cheerfully and gratefully pursue obedience to God's law. So we have God's law itself, a great gift of God's grace. Then obedience to the law, another gift of God's grace. And of course, we have the gospel of Jesus Christ in whom we are justified and by whose spirit we're sanctified. When we falter in disobedience, when we do, we confess, repent, and thank God for his grace and for sanctifying us as we rely on his promise, uh, as in Philippians 1.6, that what he has begun in us, he will surely complete. He will surely complete. How wonderful. I want to sidebar here just a second and mention that next week, Pastor Ben will be uh, teaching on chapter 20 of the confession uh, which is entitled of Christian liberty and liberty of conscience 
And it's just that just comes perfectly after two Sunday mornings on the law, doesn't it? Just I love the way the confession rolls things out. And uh, we'll, we'll conclude our study of chapter 19 of the Westminster Confession with a quote from our friend R.C. Sproul. Quoting R.C. What is the will of God for our life? The answer is our sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 If we want to know what that looks like, we have to meditate on his law. We must study the law of God all our lives. His will is for us to obey him. Unquote. Amen. Before I close us in prayer, does anyone have any comments or points or questions this morning? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. I think it, it follows up just as logically if you confound the uh, misunderstand the meaning of the law, you're going to end up making examples of Satan. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. I, you know, w- what George says emphasizes the point that R.C. made. We we have to meditate on his law. We must study the law of God all our lives. We need to understand what its ordained uses are, why it's there. How is it grace? How is it of grace? We need, need to, to, to know those things. Um, yeah, any, anyone else at all? Yes, good points. Rob. Well, as Stephen pointed out, um, it's not merely the outward expression of sin that is being dealt with in the moral law. I was reading this morning um, the, the theological note in the Reformation Study Bible, and, and interestingly enough, it certainly applies here. It amplifies again what Paul was saying. God requires a total obedience of each person to all the applications of the law, as Westminster Larger Catechism 99 says, the whole man unto obedience forever. The spiritual, and so, reaches the understanding, the will, the affections, and all other powers of the soul, Uh as well as the words, works, and gestures. Uh, So in other words, 
other words, desire as well as action must be right. Mm -hmm. And no outward um, expression is going to be able to deal with that. that that's the very hypocrisy that we all have. Mm -hmm. We think that if we outwardly do it, we're done. Yes. Yeah, excellent. And uh, certainly Jesus himself put that to, really to rest and to bed in the Sermon on the Mount, and particularly in Matthew chapter 5, right? It's a big point that he made. Okay, let, uh, let's close in prayer now. Heavenly Father, we marvel at your amazing grace and your amazing plan of redemption including the gracious provision of your law and gospel. We're grateful to hear and be reminded of your law and gospel and for the great privilege of approaching your table humbly and with assurance of your love and grace. We thank you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.